the, you know, the Holy Father's works. It's just not something to get through, but it's really something to slowly go through and, and meditate and pray with as, as we uh, um, you know, take in his, his words. So, am I on now? You're on. Okay, great. You know, when this encyclical letter came out, Laudato Si, again, it's called On Care for Our Common Home, um, it, it caused a lot of stir in the media and from people everywhere. You know, just, just before, even before it was published, and some of it, like, leaked out into the press, like, the media took it and, you know, began to dissect it in the way they saw it. And um, so it did cause a lot of story. And many thought the Holy Father, this is what, you know, some of the media that I read and heard on, on television and the radio, that the Holy Father should stay out of, it, out of the environmental dialogue that has been mostly framed from a political and scientific and economic standpoint. He said, Holy Father should not make, be making statements about the, uh, about, um, the environment. But, if we look at this document, Pope Francis, he calls all people to consider our deep and intertwined relationships with God, with our brothers and sisters, and, and the gifts that our Creator has provided for our stewardship. So with this encyclical, Pope Francis, he brings, as he does in all his writings, he brings the language of faith um, into the discussion. I mean, obviously, not all people are believers who read his stuff, but he, and he's not, and you know, and, and and so, and he's not imposing his beliefs on those concerned about the environment. But the encyclical, I think, firmly grounds the discussion in a spiritual perspective, and then it invites others to listen from a religious point of view. Particular, its understanding of creation as, 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 as a holy and a, as a precious gift from God to be revered by all people. You know, if we, if we, look, if we look at the first chapter of the book of Genesis, you know, we see that God breathed life into all of creation. You know, it's not that it's, not that it's just his footprint that's in creation, so to speak, but the very life, the very spirit of God is at the heart of all created things, all of creation. And so people, for people of faith, I think every part and every aspect of our lives should be viewed from a spiritual perspective. And that's hard to do when we live in a culture that wants, wants to dismiss you know, any type of, you know, you know, the spiritual realm of people's lives and, and, and faith. So from the perspective of some Catholic theologians, I think one of the greatest contributions of Laudato Si is, is that it offers you know, a very systematic approach to an issue. You know, first of all, Pope Francis links all of us to creation. And he says, this, this is paragraph number 39, he says, we are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. And so by our decisions, particularly about production and consumption, you know, they, it has, they have an unescapable effect on the environment. And from the Holy Father's perspective, oftentimes at the expense of the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. And most oftentimes it's for the sake of profit. It's for the sake of profit. So in this encyclical, Pope Francis, he... You have to think about where he came from. You know, his own upbringing, his, his own background, you know, the, the country in which he lived and was raised and, and formed. Um, obviously very poor. And, you know, people were, were, were marginalized. And, and, you know, there was a, you know, it really was, you know, a lot of corporate money being made at the expense of, of the people that are most vulnerable in, 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 in his country. And so as he writes this encyclical, he draws from the experience of people all around the world and he's using uses the insights of, of, of the bishops' conferences in many places, Brazil, New Zealand, South Africa, Bolivia, Portugal, Germany, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, the Philippines, Australia, the United States, and, and among other places. So he's, you know, the bishops meet 
you know, we our bishop conferences all over the world. We meet every year, and so you know, in the in the conversation and the discussion among you know the bishops' conferences, you know, he relies heavily upon you know you know some of the the, the topics and and those things for the, that are discussed within those conferences. So he he draws from that, um, and in doing so, he embodies this Catholic principle of of uh, subsidiarity. You know what that means, right? Um, it's, it's in part it looks to the local experience and local solutions. So it's not a top down; it's a bottom up um, for solutions. So in this document, Pope Francis he calls for a new dialogue and, and a truly an honest debate, not one just within the Catholic Church, but globally, and with peoples all across the world, regardless of what their faith might be. And as we know, as you and I know, you know, the starting point for all social justice is the truth that you and I, all people, have been created in God's image and likeness. That's where it all begins. That's the number one tenet of our Catholic social teaching. Um, this is what gives each person his or her inherent dignity. You know, in a book called Mercy, it was by Cardinal Casper, he, he, he noted that, it, that since this dignity belongs to all human beings in common, it implies that there's, so, there's a solidarity among all peoples. Whether we know them by name or not, there's still a solidarity among all people. And um, this should cause all of us, I think, to reflect up upon just how are we connected to one another. You know, so the heartbeat of social justice is contained in this reality. The reality that we, everyone has been created in God's image and likeness, and, and this reality of solidarity, that, that we're all connected to one another. But in a culture which thrives on and teaches individualism and relativism and consumerism, etc., all these isms, the notion of solidarity can be a foreign word to many people. And if it's not a foreign word, it may be still rejected, even though some of the people might know what it means, but they don't agree or they don't believe it. Um, but it is, it's an, it's an important you know, value of, of, of who we are as, as people created in God's image and likeness. You know, almost 50 years ago, the blessed Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, he wrote that true development requires a true commitment to solidarity. The idea that we are one human family, I'm quoting him here, each responsible for all. Without solidarity, there can be no progress toward complete development. And those who are wealthy can also be poor, right, morally poor, as they live blinded by selfishness. And he says we have to overcome our, our isolation from others so that the glow of brotherly love and the helping hand of God is reflected in all our relationships and decisions. It will be interesting to see how this new administration in this country views all of this, because what we're beginning to see now is... It's, it's not some global thing, but an isolationism, I think, in some sense, and, and what, he's, what the, the President Trump is beginning to, to do. So, and I know the church, um, the bishops will be coming out with some pretty strong statements, I think, as, as he moves into his you know, um, presidency. We'll see what happens. But, you know, in, in the passage of, from Genesis, we read, you know, have dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, all the living things that crawl on the earth. You know, everything created. You know, have dominion. Well, dominion, um, it might have a different meaning, perhaps, than what we might expect. But this dominion lays a foundation for social justice. You know, in, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, the word dominion is rada. That says R-A-D-H. It's a royal word, and it's, and, and it's the dominating rule of a king. But the word must be understood within the context of this entire, this entire command that God gives to the first couple in Genesis. Verse 27 tells us that God creates humans in God's image and likeness, and according to God's image and likeness. So God calls all women and men to exercise this rada, or this dominion over creation, this dominion that's in the image and likeness of God. One example, we see that dominion looks like this. And I'm quoting from, um, I'm, actually I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly, but it's, it's from the sacred scriptures. 
He delivers the needy when they call. This is dominion. He delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. This is dominion. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. In other words, God does not exploit or dominate or consume recklessly. God places or does not use his power to hurt, but he uses his power to heal. God values what cannot be replaced. God works to preserve life, not to destroy it. That's dominion. And so you and I have been given responsibility for all of creation to have dominion over all the whole created world. And this is what it looks like. You know, we lift up the needy and the poor and the most vulnerable. And um, you know, we, we work to preserve life, not to destroy it. We want to protect and defend and gives, you know, this dominion gives justice. So applying this to the command for humanity to exercise dominion over creation, we can see that while we have some sense we rule over creation, we're called to protect it. And just as the king should take care of the weak and the poor in his kingdom, so we too are called to the same dominion. So Pope Francis, he teaches that the care of the things of the earth is necessarily bound together with our care for one another, especially the poor. And this interdependency extends from the deep respect of every human person to all living beings and to the earth where we make our home. He says each creature has its own purpose and the entire material universe speaks of God's love. And so our Catholic social teaching is a response to this interdependency, reminding you and me that care for the things of the earth is in, in fact bound very deeply and intimately together with our care for one another. And so the Pope Francis makes it clear that, when, that, that we were given the earth as a gift of our Creator, and so it's our responsibility to avoid contributing to a culture of greed or contributing to a culture of individualism or exploitation. And he re repeatedly urges us to not only a renewed and urgent action, but you know, an honest dialogue about our environment, both social and ecological. In fact, he wrote, and this is paragraph 48, he said, the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. The human environment, us, and the natural environment deteriorate together both of which disproportionately affect our poorest brothers and sisters. And so reflecting on our, for example, our inner city slums or the lack of clean drinking water and a consumerism mentality, Pope Francis, he asks this question, what kind of world do we want to leave those who come after us? What kind of world do we want to leave those who come after us? And this question is at the very heart of this encyclical. And it rightly calls us to all work harder against the challenges that the human family faces today. And so one last note, you know, that's, I think as the, as the day goes on, there'll be more discussion and conversation about this document from Laudato Si. But, you know, some may argue that this papal encyclical on the environment has no real authority. Right? Some may argue that, but but Pope Francis explicitly states that Laudato Si is now added to the body of Catholic social teaching. This document is now added to the body of Catholic social, of social teaching. And, you know, some, you may or may not know this, but an encyclical is a type of teaching that enjoys the highest level of authority in the church, second only to the gospel and the church councils like the Second Vatican Council. And so as such, it continues the, the kind of reflection on modern day issues and problems that began back during the Pope Leo XIII's time when he wrote Rerum Novarum. That was an encyclical on capital and labor. That's very much a part of our Catholic social teaching. And so Pope Francis uses some of the traditional foundations of Catholic social teaching particularly the idea of the common good, to kind of frame this encyclical. 
<clears throat> and in keeping with the practices of Catholic social teacher, he combines the riches of Catholic theology, the church's theology, with the findings of experts in a variety of fields to reflect on, uh, upon these modern day issues and problems. So that to that end, he very explicitly links you know, St. Um, Paul or St. John the 23rd's encyclical Pachum and Taris, in which that in that, in that cyclical he addressed, um, John the 23rd addressed the crisis of nuclear war. But Pope Francis, he, he explicitly links that document with Laudato Si, which addresses this, this newer crisis in our world today. So, and to the, and in this end, you know, genuine efforts, efforts to true dialogue will require some sacrifice and the confronting, confronting of good faith disagreements. You know, everyone has, many people have a different, you know, thought about climate change. You know, some say it's not, it doesn't exist, some says it's really bad. You know, everyone's it's all over the map regarding some of the things. And it's just, it's kind of hard and everyone can kind of, they get grounded, you know, their feet dug in and, you know, so there's not, oftentimes there's not good faith dialogue amidst these disagreements. And Pope Francis, we, that has to change. And so he, he says, let us be encouraged that at the heart of this world, the Lord of life who loves us so much is always present, you know. When, 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 if, if we really believe everyone has been created in God's image and likeness, then there should always be an openness to dialogue in the midst of disagreements, in the midst of seeing things perhaps in a different way, because it's a sign of respect for the God in that person. Huh? It's a sign of respect for and love of God in that person. And sometimes we forget that, you know, because we get blinded by our own opinions. We get blinded by, you know, Doug and we, we, get, we dig in because we want to be right. And we want to prove you're wrong. I mean, that's, that's the heart of, that's often, I mean, that's obviously the heart of sin. Um, um, so we're invited to be open to one another. Um, and so, you know, God does not abandon us. He has united us definitively to one another and to our earth. And His love constantly impels us to find new ways forward. That's from paragraph 245 in this document. So, in the end, um, may all of us help to answer Pope Francis' call in this encyclical, receiving his message with an openness and growing in our own responsibility um, towards the common home that God has entrusted to all of us. Amen. You know, be honest. I I don't. I, don't, I mean, I, I can't comment on that because I. I mean, my guess would be that you know we all live in this you know this 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 ecological world, you know, and every every part of creation is is intricately connected or related to to one you know to other to you know all parts of creation is is connected and related. And so the, the conversion part of it is that we, it's a, to see it in that sense, that, that there is this interrelatedness, inter this relationship, to see it in such a way. Um, because we don't always do that. I mean, if you think about, you know, so the conversion is in our own hearts, I think, is, is what he's probably referring to, that would be my guess. That, that, that we have to be converted, you know, in, in, in the Lord in order to really to see all of that. I mean, it was God's intention from the beginning as he created the world. And so, um, and so the conversion is, is, is to, to live in the world in such a way that we don't abuse it and we see it as, as this gift and our connectedness to that. Not for our own consumption, but really to, you know, Pope Francis, his, his concern is, is the consumerism and the capitalism in our world today no, no matter what country it's in, it's using up all the natural resources. And, and where is that going? And it's, it's oftentimes at the expense of the poor and the most vulnerable. And, and that's, I, that's the perspective he's coming from, is we're not taking care of the least and vulnerable among us in the way that we use the earth today. And so this ecological conversion, I think, is in our own hearts and so for us to see that. I just make a comment. Um, I think we have our
more rich um, um, access to our Native American uh, culture here. And they have, interestingly, as you were going through that, I, I was impressed how similar the thinking is to their cultural beliefs. Um, in fact, they have a very even a deeper sort of embrace of the um, unity with the environment right. and as part of their spirituality. <coughs> Um, I don't know if you could comment about it, if anyone else could comment about it, but I would uh, say that they would be a source of wisdom to us and that we should embrace that dialogue with them. And uh, if you could comment. Well, I think you're right. I mean, this is it's very much a part of who they are. And there's been this, this uh, their whole history. I mean, they're this, this, is, this is really, you know, born into their very life. And, and they've always seen from the beginning um, this relationship between... God, their own life, their own spirit in the land, and what that brings. And so, I mean, I don't, other, I, don't, I, don't know, I can't comment much more than that. But it is, it's very much an integral part of who they are, and what, and, and their deepest held beliefs. And we, and there is a lot we could learn from them. I mean, if we're willing to listen. I mean, that's the problem. Sometimes we're not willing to listen. Um, Pope Francis has always been ever since you know his whole thing is dialogue, I and mean, we have to dialogue, you know. We and we can't just dig in with our opinions. We really, you know, the pathway forward is through dialogue. I mean, he, his talk when he was in this when he was in America, um, you know, September a year. I mean, when he, uh, you know, talked to the members of Congress, it was he was very clear about this dialogue. We, you know, if, if we're if, if the, the the pathway forward. Um, to peace and justice is really through it's through dialogue and listening to people you know and listen have an openness to others um, and sometimes that's hard especially in this culture in which we live in, in this country in particular when you know when uh, everyone's entrenched in their side you know whether it be Republicans and Democrats I mean we can't there's, there seems to be no path forward because no one wants to listen to each other and that's, I mean, that's, solutions will never happen if we don't take the time and listen. And the, because that's what build relationships that can really move the world forward. It's not digging in, you know, digging in and, and approaching people like this, you know, it's really like this. Right? Amen.